Well, hello. Welcome to Odenton Baptist Church for our live stream service. We want to thank you for taking time to uh, look at the service and worship with us today. And while the live stream is a great opportunity for us to gather around and worship together and hear the Word of God expounded, it does not take the place of a local church. You need to make sure that you are uh, finding a church and being involved with the church. If you'd like to know, know more about Odenton Baptist Church, our, you can go to our website, uh, odentonbaptist.org. Uh, we pray that this live stream service today will be a blessing to you. Good morning. Welcome to Odenton Baptist Church and uh, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, whether you're uh, online or whether you're here. Uh, great to have you with us. Uh, if you would, please turn in your hymnals to uh, page 364. We're going to sing the first, second, and last of Standing on the Promises. Please go ahead and stand with me as we, as we sing this. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest, shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Thank you very much. Be seated. All right. Well, welcome to Odenton Baptist Church on this beautiful Mother's Day. God gave us a beautiful sunshining day for us to celebrate our mothers, and we do want to extend that uh, love from the Word of God to all of our mothers out there. We are thankful for you. Uh, I am thankful for my mother, even though she's going through some health issues right now. I'm very, uh, very happy and thankful that God has given me the mother that I have had. Uh, and we could probably go around and have each individual give uh, a statement of how their mother has impacted their life in such an a powerful fashion, a powerful way, and we would all uh, have that opportunity to just give that honor and praise to our mothers. I'm thankful to God uh, for that. I'm thankful for mothers, otherwise dads would have to do it all, and we would blow it all up, uh, and that it would just, I mean, we, kids would be running around Lord of the Flies style, face painted, spears in hand. Uh, thank, uh, some of the ladies are shaking their heads. Thank God for mothers, Amen. All right, just a few announcements that we have here. We want to invite you out to our uh, afternoon service, 4 o'clock. Get involved with that, odentonbaptist.org, uh, the same place where you went to watch this live stream video. And in the evening, on that sun Sunday afternoon, we do our uh, request and praises, and you type in and you let us know what song you want uh, to sing or what hymn you'd like to sing uh, last week we had a children's emphasis, and so we, we sang a lot of songs, some of which uh, I've not heard before or that I, weren't, I wasn't very familiar with. 
uh, but it was a good time, and I really enjoyed that, and, and thankful to Mr. Stover for putting that together. Uh, don't forget, every Wednesday at 7 o'clock p.m., we have our Bible study uh, in here in the auditorium, uh, live streamed out, and we're going through uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, His powerful interactions with various different people through the Gospel of John. Uh, it's just amazing. We're going to be uh, continuing on in that series on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, I'm sorry, that's not true. Wednesday, we're going to have a guest speaker. We're going to have Mr. Scott Milner, who is going to present the Word of God uh, for us. And then on Thursday, we have our Bible study in the book of Ezekiel. Now, that is a, a Google chat. You can get with Mr. Dan Enderly for that, uh, denderly at odentonbaptist.org, and he will get you all set up if you're interested in participating with that call. And then uh, on Sunday, we have two services in the a.m. We have 8.30 service and 11 o'clock. 8.30 is meeting, meeting in here in the auditorium. At 11 o'clock, we actually have... Now, you'll be streaming this at 11, but we're going to be outside in our drive-in service at 11 o'clock. Uh, you're more than welcome to come out and join us every Sunday afternoon at 11 o'clock, morning at 11 o'clock, and we go to just about a little after noon. Uh, and it's just a good time of fellowship in the Word of God, assembling together. And that's what we're, we're called to do, assemble together, and we want to invite you to come and be a part of that. Don't forget about our youth group, our virtual youth group, every Friday at 6 o'clock p.m., uh, and if you're interested in being a part of that, you can see either Mr. Enderly get you set up or Mr. Reagan, and they'll make sure that you have exactly the information you need. Uh, well, let's go ahead and stand. We're going to have a word of prayer, and then we'll have uh, Brother Richards come back. I am thankful for Brother Eric uh, and also Mrs. Carrie Vaughn, who is volunteering to step in. Ms. Keener has to go down, had to go down to Missouri to help her grandmother, who had, who's having a bypass surgery. Uh, and Brother Stover is traveling, and so thankful very much so for uh, these folks who step up. And then always Mr. Enderly uh, up in the booth who does everything pertaining to our technology. And then, of course, we have our folks around here, Brother Teske, who helps us with the 11 o'clock service and getting all those things. Uh, none of this could happen without the amazing and tremendous support staff that we have here at Odenton Baptist Church, and we're extremely thankful for them. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for our mothers. Father, without our mothers, we would not be the people we are today. We would not have the influence. We would not have uh, the uh, gravity that we have had to allow us to have the lives that we have come to possess. Father, we do pray that you would bless mothers today. It's just one day that we honor them, but Father, we consider them and think of them uh, on a daily basis. We pray that you would be with this particular service, Father, that you would bless this, that you would allow the live stream to go out with power and authority to captivate individuals with the truth of the gospel, and that people would come to the saving knowledge of Christ and believers would be submitted unto you. We love you, Father, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Eric, come and lead us in another hymn. All right, stay standing. Uh, turn with me to, to hymn number 22. We're going to sing the first, second, and last of Are You Washed in the Blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin, and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a 
fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Thank you very much. You may be seated. All right, go ahead and get your Bibles out. We will be in Psalm 85. This will be our last Sunday here. That will be in Psalm 85. But we will be continuing our Ready for Revival uh, series as we look at different aspects of uh, revival. We are going to be looking at, right now we're looking at pray for revival. But the question is, are we prepared for revival? And we can see uh, through the life of Joseph, how God prepared Joseph from even as a young age, giving him the word of God for him to be prepared for really what we could call revival uh, when he brings his whole family down to Egypt and God provides and cares for them in such a miraculous fashion. There was preparation and many times that preparation it isn't the way we expect. We we, we, you know, it's like we go to the gym, you got to stretch, and there are those people who go in and they're getting ready to work out, and they stretch for like one minute, and then they're ready to get back at or get at lifting weights. Uh, you're not really prepared yet. You got to uh, warm up and be ready to work your muscles. A lot of times, we, that's the way we prepare. Okay, God, I, I want revival now. And God says, hey, but are you prepared? I believe all the things that we're going through right now, truthfully, this whole COVID-19, actually the last several years here for, in Odenton, is drawing our attention away from uh, all of the, the outer things and really putting our attention back where it's supposed to be on people and the need for revival, the gospel going out powerfully. And so next week we're going to be looking at the life of Joseph and being prepared for revival. But this week we're going to continue in Psalm 85. We looked already at praying with praise and how praise is such an important part of our spiritual walk. And how really, if we're going to see biblical revival, we've got to praise the God who can bring revival. I can't bring revival, but He can. I need to exalt Him and put Him in His proper place in my life. Last week, we looked at praying with patience, and how many of us begin praying for something, and then we what? We stop. We're not persistent we don't have that, that longevity in it. And if we're going to see biblical revival come, we have got to be people who pray patiently, consistently, persistently. And this week we're going to look at an aspect of praying with purpose. I, I desire revival. I believe God will bring revival. I believe that the will of God is for the United States, for Odenton, for Maryland, for Anne Arundel County, for the entire world to experience biblical revival. I do believe that's the will of God. God left us here for a purpose. And what is that purpose? To bring revival. To see people saved, born again. To see churches established in strength. Now, we have allowed our cultural uh, things to, to guide us in the way that we do that, but I believe now is time for us to, ju just to go back to the Word of God and look at what biblical revival is all about. And that's where it brings to Psalm uh, 85. We're going to be looking at praying with purpose. We're going to begin reading here at verse number 9. He says, Surely His salvation is nigh them that fear Him, that glory may dwell in our land. That's revival right there, amen? His glory will dwell in our land. And then verse number 10 says, Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. He gives us these two little uh, aspects, and we're going to look at this. Mercy and truth, how they are met together, and then there's a semicolon there, and then he gives us righteousness and peace have kissed each other. We're going to look at that in just a moment. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before Him and shall set us in the way of His steps. Father, we come before You this uh, morning and we pray, God, that You would speak to us. 
Challenge us with your word. Help us, Father, to see how you desire revival. And Father, allow our prayers to be prayers of faith, believing that you will bring revival. Help us to pray with biblical purpose, desiring to see your will come to pass. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I have to get uh, my phone for just a moment. I have a quote on here I'd like to read as we get into this. This is uh, a quote from Tozer, and he says this. He says, I long for the positive and genuine renewal that would come if the will of God could be totally accomplished in our lives. Everything that is unspiritual would flee, and all that is not Christ-like would vanish away, and all that is not according to the New Testament would be rejected. What he's saying there is just simply, if the will of God was really made manifest in our life, all of those areas of sin and contradiction in our life would flee away. If I would just simply grab hold of the entirety of the will of God, if I would allow the will of God to have absolute purpose in my life, now the will of God is, is, is truth, but if I would allow that into my life, everything else would flee away. Uh, and, and there is a power behind faith in the will of God. Uh, one of my favorite stories in the Bible or accounts in the, in the Bible is found in Matthew chapter 14. And it is the story of Peter walking on the water. Uh, of all of the biblical characters, I, I kind of find myself uh, identifying with Peter uh, the most. You know, I, he was a little bit rebellious and I have a tendency to be a little bit rebellious. Uh, he was a little bit hot-headed and I have a tendency to be a little bit hot-headed. He, he didn't seem to have the highest of intelligence and in, in logic all the time, and I guess I could fall into that as well. Uh, he loved God, and he meant well, but sometimes he was his own worst enemy. Any, anybody else find yourself there? I, I love God, and, and I mean well, but many times I am my own worst enemy. I, I think of uh, when when the Mount of Transfiguration, and Peter just doesn't know what to say. And so he says, let's make some tabernacles. Uh, that's kind of something I would do. I don't know what to say, so let me, let me speak. Uh, and so Peter here, I, I have studied his life, and I, I see so many similarities. You know, I wish I were Paul. You know, like this logical intellectual that has this argument that no man can refute uh, and walks with the, with the strength and he gets beat and he's singing songs unto God and glorifying God. I'm pretty sure if Peter got beat, he'd be like, why are you guys doing it? He'd be falling apart. That, that's me, right? But, but I, I identify very much with Peter. And Peter is a man that had mountain-moving faith at times. And at other times, he had the Mariana Trench depths of failures. Uh, I can find myself there as well. I speak before I sometimes uh, understand what the Spirit of God would actually have me to speak. And yet other times, guess what? I can speak with the wisdom of the Spirit of God. I can identify with Peter, and I trust that many of you can as well. And so in Matthew 14, the disciples had just experienced an amazing scene play out. They, they saw the feeding of the 5,000, and God using them to see that event carried out. It really was an amazing feat. Jesus, then Jesus takes them, he says, hey, you guys go across the Sea of Galilee. I want you to go over on the other side of the sea. I'm going to send the multitudes away and go up and pray. And so they get out there and they start rowing across and we know the story. The wind is contrary and so they're trying to get across. They can't make it. They, don't, they, they get far out there but not all the way, but a little bit more than halfway. And it's the middle of the night. And in the darkness, they look out and they see an apparition walking towards them. And what do they do? They stand in their faith. Nope. They, they are like us. They are at the bottom of the boat, trembling together, saying, ah, what are we going to do? There's this ghost coming our way. 
And then Peter, because Peter never knows, he's like, well, I got to do something, right? Isn't that what we, I got to do something. So he stands up. And of all of the things, he hears the voice, be not afraid, it is I. I wish Tim was here because he's got that really good voice. Be not afraid, it is I. And Peter stands up and he goes over and what, is, of all of the things he could say, what does he say? He, I think he just didn't know what to say. So he says, Lord, if it's really you, bid me to come out on the water unto you. Now think about that for just a moment. If that were some evil spirit and he said, if it's really you, that, that thing's going to lie and say, come on out, Peter. We know what you're getting ready to do. We, we know what God has for you. Yeah, step out in the water and die. Well, Peter just doesn't think. But he stands up and he's like, Lord, if it's you, bid me come out of the water unto you. And he hears that word. What is it? Come. What word? Now here's some mountain moving faith. He just hears, he, he's not even sure it's Christ. He's over here, all the other guys are, are down there shivering away in their fear. And what does he do? He's like, watch this. Hey, guys, right? Famous last words, Millennium Falcon kind of stuff. Watch this. And he takes that step. And what happens? He doesn't sink. Now, we don't know how far he walked. We don't know how far he walked. The Bible doesn't tell us. I mean, he could have walked half a football field, or he could have walked three or four steps. We don't know. But here's what we know. He did something that no one else has ever done. Aside from the Lord Jesus Christ, no human being has walked on the water. Moses walked through on dry land. We know that uh, uh, Joshua took a step, and when he took a step, the the water flew away, fled away, walked on dry land. But nobody ever walked on water. That was Peter. Peter, God's like, listen, Peter, I'm not even going to make the water flee. You're going to walk on the water. Why? Because I can't. I can do the impossible, but I want and I need your faith to see it happen here in the material realm. So Christ could have uh, had the water flee away. He could have done all sorts of things. But he demonstrated his ability and power to manipulate the material existence by letting Peter do that which is physically, According to the laws of science and physics, yes, water is a non-compressible, but it has to be in a container for it not to compress. It will fluid and spread and move around. It isn't a solid. And so as he takes that step, what should have happened is what? Down he goes. But because God has all power, and he takes that potential for all of the power and couples it up with Peter's faith and the impossible takes place. You see, God has all the power all of the time to do all things. Where is the breakdown? We don't even have mustard seed-sized faith. That's the breakdown. It's us. And so when we see here in Psalm 85, you know what we see, Ms. Vaughn? We don't see just, we don't just see mustard seed side faith. We see mountain moving faith, truth faith, that God will bring revival. And so as we look here and we're praying for revival, are we praying with purpose? It's one thing just to say, God, I pray you bring revival. God, I pray you bring revival. And then think, you know, we're never, the world is so nasty right now. It's not in a good place. Have you seen it out here? It is not pretty. Have you watched the news? It's over. We might as well just throw in the towel now. What kind of, but I'm going to pray for revival. You don't even mean it. Don't even bother praying for revival if that's your heart. You got to mean it. You got to pray with purpose. I believe when Peter stood there, he said, Lord, if it be you, bid me. Come out on the water. I'll come unto you. I believe he he was going to do it. When, when, when he prayed that prayer, it wasn't, well, if it's really you, let me, over here with the disciples down in the, hey, God, if you want me to come unto you, let me know and I'll, I'll come. That's not what he did. He was standing there right on, the, on the, uh, the edge of the boat looking out and he was willing to take the step. Are you praying for revival with purpose? Really believing God's going to do it. I am. I know it's coming. I don't know when, but I know it's coming. I know revival is coming. In today's world, many people think revival is impossible. And truthfully, as far as the physical, material existence goes, it probably is. People are distracted. People are indoctrinated. People are fearful. There are storms all around. 
is impossible for us. But aren't you thankful that we serve a God that can do the impossible? Don't, aren't you thankful that if you just have a mustard seed sized faith, we can see revival? I mean, you don't even have to have a walnut sized faith. Just a mustard seeds seed sized faith. Say that 15 times fast. And you will see revival. Just a little faith. You know, I had a mustard seed sized faith in 1995 when I cried out to the Lord Jesus Christ to save me, and he did. I had a mustard seed sized faith when we arrived in Thailand, and I, I was faced with the daunting task of learning the Thai language, and I did. And I, and I see, I had a, a mustard seed sized faith when, when we were sitting there witnessing the people in, in a different language, thinking, are they even understanding what I'm saying? And we saw people saved, baptized, discipled, and churches still moving forward, glorifying and honoring God. That's a mustard seed sized faith. I wish I had a bigger walnut or, or even a, a watermelon seed sized faith. But all it takes is a mustard seed, side, mustard seed sized faith. Peter had a little faith and he did the impossible, but do you? You're praying for revival. Are you ready? Are you purposefully praying, waiting for revival to take place? Saying, all right, God, I'm ready. I know it's coming. Because faith is the substance of things what? Hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. All evidence to revival in this dispensation at this point in time, we're looking, we're saying, it ain't coming. Look at, how, look at how worldly and carnal the world is. But that's where faith comes in. And so we need to pray with purpose. Look with me, if you would. Have. We're going to just look at uh, a couple of different aspects, three different things, uh, as we look at praying purposefully for revival. We need to trust that God will answer the prayer, believing by faith that he will hear his people praying with the mustard seed-sized faith. Verse number 8 says, Oh, Lord God of hosts, who, I'm in 89, I was like, that does not seem like anything I had read already. I will hear, here it is, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. I am ready, I am waiting, I know it's coming, I am listening, I am ready by faith, for he will speak. I will hear because he will speak. That's faith. He says, for he will speak unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to their folly. Let them not turn again to folly. See, here's where the faith comes in. I know God's going to speak. I will hear. Don't let me get distracted. Don't let me look at the storm and turn to my folly. Let me concentrate on the one who is able to accomplish the task. How many of you get distracted? Right? I mean... You know, we, are, uh, live, we live in a day and age that lends itself to distractions. I well, we spent some time with family yesterday. Uh, my two of my daughters graduated college. Very exciting time for us. And so we were sitting there talking. And in a room full of, I don't even know, uh, probably 10 different people, all of whom have cell phones, Throughout various different times, as we're sitting there spending time together, you're hearing ding, ding, brr, brr, ding, ding. And everybody, as they're talking, what are they doing? Nobody's ignoring that. They're all, as soon as the, they hear it, they pick it up and look, and then they start, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yep, yep, yep. Why? Because we are distracted people. We, we don't, in today's day and age, we, we don't know what it means to have the discipline of having an attention on one thing and one thing only. Now, God has maybe blessed me or, or cursed me. I am not a multitasker. Dan Enderly will tell you, he, if I'm typing something and he comes in and he's like, hey, pastor, I'm like, nope, I'm going to lose this thought. No, nope, I can't. I, can't. I want to talk with you. I want to be nice, but I can't right now because if I stop and look at you, I'm going to come back to here and say, well, well, what was I doing? Because I can be distracted. And so we, that's where we live. That's where we dwell. God says, don't be distracted. Walk in faith. Pray with purpose. 
And I, I love that when we get into uh, verse, verses uh, 9 and 10, we see some things come to pass. He says, Surely His salvation is nigh them that fear Him, that glory may dwell in our land. And, 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 and so, salvation is nigh. It's coming. It's almost here. We have to do what? We have to be consistent and persistent. We have to be uh, purposefully praying, walking in faith, waiting for revival. And when that happens, verse number 10 says, mercy and truth are met together. When God's people walk by faith, the seeds of revival are sown in mercy and truth. They come together in such a fashion that people get right with God. That the gospel is going out amongst the heathen and individuals are repenting and turning to Christ. There is a, a we're going to look at this in the afternoon, the four o'clock, but I'm going to reference it here now. In Acts chapter 8 and verses 1 through 8, right after the stoning of Stephen, we see persecution come upon the church. That young man, Saul, immediately goes out and he is hunting down the Christians. He is persecuting them. He is putting them in prison. The Bible uses the word, he caused havoc in the church. They had persecution like we wouldn't comprehend. We think we're going through some persecution right now uh, because the governors won't let us meet. But they knew persecution. They, they knew it in a manner that, that we didn't. Putting them in prison, and, and, and the prison system was much different then than it is now. But Philip didn't let that keep him from seeing revival come to pass. Philip takes off, and he's, they're scattered. He goes into Samaria, and he begins preaching the gospel. He's preaching the truth. The Bible tells us that, that as he's preaching, he's preaching the power of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. He didn't say, listen, oh God, there's, there's persecution. I'm going to go into hiding. I'm going to uh, lock myself in my room. I am going to cry and whine to my friends. I am going to be sad and disheartened and fall into depression. He said, I'm going to do something with the Word of God. And so during that persecution, he goes out and he preaches truth. And you see an amazing revival begin to take place in Samaria. So much is going on there that the, the apostles, John and Peter, go up to see exactly what's going on. He's hearing people are getting saved, people are getting baptized, and he lays hands on, and the power of the Spirit of God comes, and, and, and now it shows that the Holy Spirit is given to the Samaritans as well. An amazing revival takes place. Because they were purposeful by faith. They didn't let the storm and get distracted by the storm. They kept on praying. They kept on serving. They kept on going. And that's what we have to do. Mercy and truth. We deserve judgment because we're all sinners. All mankind has sinned. There's not anybody here on this earth today that you could look at and say, well, I have never done one thing wrong. Never. Usually a lot of times you ask the, the little kids. I love talking to the, the kids in chapel. I, I, the video's okay, but I really like seeing their faces when you're interacting. And I love saying with the kindergarten, it's like, how many of you are sinners? And, and some of them will raise their hand, and usually typically most. Some won't. But then you'll say something like, how many of you are dirty, rotten, filthy, no good, unredeemable sinners? Not a single one of them will raise their hand. Not it. I've never done anything like that. Because that's the way we look at things. We kind of quantify sin and we categorize it. But that's not what God does. God looks at the sin of Adam, the disobedience and eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, as grounds for death and separation. But here's where mercy comes in. God's mercy says, although you, Luke Teske, deserve death, I'm going to give you life. And then truth comes to guide us. God's mercy is, and I love this, is bound to his truth. God doesn't pick, he's just. And so he doesn't just pick and choose. All right, you, I like the way your hair looks today. Okay, you get it. You, not so much. Eric, you got a motorcycle, you're out. Maryland sweatshirts, no good. But Brother Merritt, you're good. But God, that's not how God, God doesn't pick that way. 
I have a Maryland sweatshirt, just so you know. But, uh, but, but that's not how God, God's, his truth. This is what he says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Ready? That whosoever, what? Believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So God has truth to go along with his mercy. His mercy is bound to his truth. And the only way to receive that mercy is when truth is met with it. And so here, when we're praying for revival, we're not just praying for people to have some spiritual you know, experience. Yes, in the middle of the night, after eating a whole pizza by myself, God appeared to me, and now I know I have a relationship with him. That's not how that works. It's the word of God, the truth right here. The word of God meets up with mercy, and God guides his truth through the spirit of God to show us that all men's are, men are sinners, and in their sin, they need a savior. We can't save ourselves. We can't do it. I, I have uh, been attempting to work on my car and do some things, and I find that there are some things that I just can't do myself. And that's why Jesus Christ came to this earth. And he died on the cross for us. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. That's it. All to him. And so when we look here, we see Jesus paid it all on the cross and he destroyed death and hell through the resurrection. It's all paid for on the cross and in the resurrection, he destroys the penalty of sin. And he gives that extension, not just to us, but to all men. And so here's where revival, are we praying for revival? Because God is willing. He's already done all of the work on the cross. Where is the breakdown? I believe the breakdown is in the faith of men. And so we have the seed of revival and mercy and truth, but we also have the seed of revival and righteousness and peace. They have kissed each other, it says in verse number 10. You know, when you get saved, when you trust in Christ, one of the breakdowns is God's people don't live like God's people. People who claim to be born again, who claim to be saved, uh, many times they try to go on living their life outside of the structure of the Word of God. But that's where righteousness and peace come together. If I live the changed life and allow my life to glorify God, you know what I end up having in my life? Peace. Because you are saved, you need to live righteously. And that's when peace comes. If you're a Christian, you just try to live an unrighteous life and see how peaceful your life is. See how happy your life is. You know, we got to stop trying to live our lives following and chasing after the carnal desires. There's no peace in your Christian life there. It never brings satisfaction. I've mentioned before a pastor, a former pastor by the name of Gabe Rivera and his situation where, where he had fallen into sexual perversions and sexual sin. It, that sin destroyed his ministry as a missionary. He is no longer in the ministry fulfilling that portion. It, it broke his family. His wife left him and his children, all but one, have, have pretty much disinherited him. Sin led to brokenness of heart. There was no peace. He thought, oh, that's what I want. And so he chased after it, but there's no peace in his life. But you know, this is where, where, where God is, is greater than all things. When we're really saved, we always had that chance to be that prodigal son that comes back and says, God, I'm, I blew it. Forgive me. Because the Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And God will take us back and we can have that righteousness match up with God's peace again and have them kiss each other and walk and our life can have peace. Now, unfortunately, you will never be able to shake off or change the marks that sin have left in your life. They'll always be there. There are consequences for sin. When he came back and he repented to get right, his ministry didn't miraculously come back. His family didn't miraculously come back. His wife didn't come back. His, all of those things are left there, but now he can look back on them and say, God, I still want you to use those situations in my life. There is a uh, Japanese art of repairing 
uh, China. It's called Kintsuki. Very fascinating as I was looking into this. Uh, what it is is they would have this fine china that has been all broken up and they will take gold powder, uh, silver powder, or platinum powder and they repair these uh, fine china. It's usually typically expensive items in such a way that they have those brake lines with that gold that will follow it around showing exactly where a piece had been broken and fixed. Now it's just as strong as it was before, in some cases maybe stronger, but that mark of break, brokenness is there. You can't change that. You know, in our life, you may have been broken. You may have broken pieces from sin, and sin may have left a destructive trail in your life. God can repair that and make you valuable and make you usable again as an earthen vessel unto His glory. It's never too late to come back. Now those marks of sin will still be there, but God can take that and do something beautiful with it, but you've got to be willing. And so we look at the seed of revival, and now I want us to look at the ground of revival. Look at Psalm 85 and verse number 11. Truth shall spring out of what? The earth. And righteousness shall look down from heaven. The ground of revival isn't heaven. The ground of revival is here on earth. God is looking down and He's with righteousness ready and waiting for revival to take place. But revival doesn't take place in heaven. It's going to take place with the sinners here on the terrestrial realm. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. It's here on the earth. This is where revival needs to take place. This is the battleground for revival. God gave us the Great Commission for us to see the battleground here on the earth fall and um, unfold. Now I want us to stop and consider what that means. What, when we say that here, that the battleground or the, uh, the, the ground of revival is here on earth, there are several different areas. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8 tells us that we are to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. This is where the battleground takes place. It wasn't just one particular location. We are bound to take revival to the uttermost parts of the earth. Locally. You are called to be a testimony locally. This is where you're going to have the biggest influence of your life. In your neighborhood. How many people in your neighborhood have heard you tell them about Christ? How many people, how many neighbors have you interacted with and you've had the opportunity to open up the Word of God and share how Jesus Christ died for them? In our town, in Odenton, how many times do we travel out and interact with people only to pass them by without even giving a gospel tract? The activities in our town, how active are we? Or do we isolate ourselves in our, our own little, uh, little, little club called the church and, and we look out and we snub our nose at the uh, activity of the world and think, you know, we're so much better. And we would give individuals like uh, 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 the, the church out there in Kansas, what was it that was protesting the, 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 the homosexual rallies and we would look at them and say how, how wicked and evil, how, how dare they snub their nose at sinners. Don't they know that Christ died for them? But how often do we do that in, in our own little club called Odenton Baptist Church? Regionally, we have Anne Arundel County here. How often have we had any type of impact in our county? What have we done to ensure that people are hearing about the Lord Jesus Christ nationally, internationally? See, it's all unfolded right there. 
the earth is where it's going to take place. But what are we consumed with? We're consumed with our 401ks. We're consumed with our own personal lives and making sure those are better. Not only is there the kind of what I would call the collective aspects of the Great Commission, but some things that are missed are the personal aspects of the Great Commission. Jerusalem, he wasn't talking about the city. What was he talking about? The hearts of the men in the city. There are souls in Jerusalem that needed to hear of the Savior. When we look around in here, let's just start in Odenton. Many times we come up with excuses why we shouldn't or can't be on the bus today. Many times we'll come up with excuses as to why we didn't visit our, our kids or call our Sunday school class or follow up with uh, an individual that has visited because our lives are just so busy we, we can't take that hour to see revival. See, on the one hand, we say, God, I'm ready for revival and I believe it by faith. But in the practical application of it, what happens? Oh, you know, God, I'm just busy today. I can't. Is that faith? Seeing the reason why, you know what, God, I can't step out on the water because it's liquid. And from a scientific perspective, I will sink. It wasn't all lined up perfectly for him. What did it involve? Christ, water, a boat, and the Savior with Peter. That's it. You see, what we're looking at here is the ground. We've got children all over who need the gospel. Pastor, you don't understand. Kids today aren't interested like they used to be. I can go all around the areas here and I can see bus ministries that are picking up kids. I can see Sunday school ministries that are thriving. I can see youth ministries that are growing. I can see uh, us active and going up in the rescue mission instead of finding reasons why I can't go to the rescue mission. We've got nursing homes with individuals who, who are in the twilight years of their life who need hope and revival. And we let ourselves get captivated by the things of the world and we'll say, God, I'm praying for revival. But the faith behind the revivals missing. And so we see that there's the ground of the revival, there's the seed of the revival, but there's also the fruit of revival. I love Psalm 85, verses 12 and 13. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good. Who gives? Is God. I can't bring revival. I can't give revival. I can't do anything for revival except for pray and be a vessel for God to use. God will give revival. He gives that which is good. And then he says, and our land shall yield her increase. The earth will yield increase. The terrestrial will bring forth fruit. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. Two aspects to the fruit of revival. First is we will see Salvation come when people walk by faith. When God's people walk by faith. When they pray with faith. We will see revival come. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. God desires to do something new and amazing and miraculous in your life. You may look at your life now and say, it is worthless. It has no value. It, 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 I am struggling. I don't know what I'm going to do. When you come to the Savior, He will give you purpose. He will give you direction. He will give you love and compassion and set you on a purpose to have His glory shown in your life. Reminds me of a story I heard, I don't think it was Pastor Ashton Nelson and his sister, and uh, they were out walking around and they saw this little kind of 
tuft of fur. And as they walked over, they saw this puppy. And this puppy was dirty and nasty and mangy and smelly. And the sister looked at it and said, can we keep it? And you know how dads are anyway. I was like, I don't want that thing in my house. Look at it. And she says, no, 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 I, 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 I want to help this puppy. And for whatever reason, the dad was moved with compassion and said, yeah, go ahead. She took it home and she bathed it and cared for it. Went to the vet and got special medicine to uh, get rid of the mange. And if I remember the story correctly, I could be wrong Within, within a year, that dog that the dad was ready to say, no, I don't want anything to do with, became the apple of that dad's eye. Pastor Nelson, I, I, I want to say it was a chihuahua by the name of Hercules. I, 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 I may be off, but it's something like that. And the, the, the chihuahua would travel everywhere with him. It was always in the car. It, but, but why? Because somebody intervened and said there's value. And that's what Christ has done with us. He's intervened. He sees Luke and he says, it's a mangy, no good, disgusting pup. And Jesus says, oh, but, but I can do something with him. I can redeem him. I can make him to where you, you, you wouldn't even know the state he was in before. You're going to see my righteousness in him. I'm going to give him purpose. And that's what Christ does with us. He makes us a new creature. And when we become new creatures, we don't walk in the old nature. That dog didn't go back and sleep in that same little hole with the same mangy nastiness that was there. Now he had a new home. And he had a new confidant that he would take him all over the place and give him treats and provide for him and take care of him. You and I should not continue to walk in that old nature as well. When we are saved, we have this thing called the fruit of the Spirit that should be made manifest in our life. Paul said in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 22, but now being made free from sin and becoming servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. We say we, we, we have now this, the fruit is to see people having their lives completely changed and converted from the life of sin and distress to a life of peace and righteousness. And the other aspect that we see here is holiness. It says, and shall set us in the way of His step. So that word holiness and sanctified literally means to be set apart. God takes us from our path and our direction and He sets us on His. Now we are to walk in holiness, being more like Christ. In 1 John chapter 2, in verse number 6, the Bible says, He that saith he abideth in him ought to himself also to walk even as he walked. You say, hey... I walk, I walk, I, I'm, I'm a born again believer. I am a Christian. Well, how should you walk? How Christ walked? Standing up for truth, sharing the gospel, willing to give your time to see people come to Christ on your knees in prayer, doing that which is miraculous and amazing for the glory and kingdom of God. A lot of times I, I, I want to ask people, to ask themselves, do you look more like the way that Christ looks in the Bible, or do you look more like people look in the world? If someone were to look at you and say, I am a Christian, would they look and say, you know what, I knew that about you. I knew it. I could tell by the way you behave. I could, I could see it in your... You love 
people. You're not condescending and judgmental. You care, and yet you still have an attitude of righteousness. You don't participate in the dirty jokes. You don't have the off-color humor. You don't look at things that are ungodly, and yet you still love. I knew you were a Christian. I knew it. Or tell somebody I'm a Christian. Really? Come on, really? Man, I see you every day. You do the same thing. Don't tell me that. Uh, there's a story of Mike Lehman used to share. Uh, he, he was Catholic uh, before he got saved. And he said he, he used to you know, participate in sin, didn't get saved until he was in his, his 20s. And uh, he was, I don't remember if he was in, in, in the Air Force or, or not, but he said he was at a party and a bunch of people. It was a Saturday night, and he was talking to one of his friends, and he had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth and a, and a, and a beer in his hand. And... and uh, he said, hey, man, you going to church tomorrow? Mass. He says, you going to mass tomorrow? He's like, yeah, what time are you going? He's like, I, I, man, I'm tired. I'm going to be having a hangover. Why don't we go at 11? All right, yeah, I'll pick you up. And he said, there was a girl looking at him and says, you guys are sacrilegious. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but it was like sacrilegious whatever. And Michael was like, why? He's like, you got a cigarette hanging out of your hand, or your mouth, a beer in your hand, and you're, you're, you're talking about going to church. Wait, wait, what? How does that work? You're not a Christian. You're, you do the same things we do. And I, I despise God. Well, when people look at your life, what do they see? Do, do, they see are, you, you, do they see an individual that is going to be a vessel of revival? Or do they see the weight that's holding the world back from revival? See, we, we, we'll say things like, yeah, pastor, but I have liberty. You do have liberty. I have liberty to do what I want. I am saved, I am born again, and I have liberty. Yes, you do, but the Bible tells us not to live or use our liberty, liberty for an occasion for the flesh. You have liberty so you can be used by God, not to be weighted down with the works of the law. And a lot of people are deceived, and they won't see biblical revival until we surrender everything to Christ. That's why that passage of scripture that I, or I'm sorry, that quote that I had from Tozer I thought was very powerful. So a lot of times we will have our lives and we'll say, you know, I want God to be magnified, but I don't really want his will in every area of my life because I know what that would mean. That would mean I can't continue to do the things I want to do. I like to do. But I want to tell you, I just want to, want to share with you that I was on that same journey. And I had to come to a point in time where I said, God, you know, I'm tired of just making excuses for why I'm not progressing in my spiritual walk. Will you just have your way? And I found in making that decision, you know, I have greater peace than I have ever had. I mean, I have, I have turmoil going on around me right now. I have storms in places that I didn't know storms could exist. But I have peace. And I'm ready for revival. And that peace doesn't come from me because I'm a, a, a person of anxiety. I'm, I'm a person of contemplation and I am a fixer. I want to fix everything. But I just want to trust God. He said, we're going to see revival. We've got to pray purposefully. And part of praying purposefully means that we look at the ground and we look at the seed and we look at the fruit and then I ask myself, am I being a fruit that can produce fruit? I say, what do you mean? Well, what produces a blueberry? A blueberry seed. Where does a blueberry seed come from? A blueberry seed. Am I being a fruit that is mature and grown enough that can produce, produce fruit? God desires to use you. That's where revival is going to come. It's going to come from God and His mercy and His truth being used through the vessel of His churches. So maybe you're here today and you haven't trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. I want, you, I want to tell you, He loves you. But even beyond that, 
even beyond that, he has demonstrated his care for you by taking all of the steps necessarily to pay for your sin account in full. All you have to do is receive it by faith. Christian, if you're watching this and you look at your life and you say, you know, Pastor, my life is a life of turmoil. How is God going to bring revival through a life of turmoil? I can tell you how. Are you just surrendering your life to Him? Because then you're just taking all of the turmoil out of your hands and you're putting it in His and say, God, I can't do anything with it, but you can. And when you start to see God work in your life, you will realize peace that you didn't know existed. Thank you so much for watching. If you're not saved, there's going to be a video that plays in just a moment. I want to encourage you to listen and to open your understanding and your heart to receive the truth of the gospel. Christians, spend a few minutes getting on your knees and giving your life over to God. Father, we come before you. We thank you again for allowing us to gather here. I pray, God, that you will be with our, this time of invitation, that you would call sinners to repentance and you would call saints to holiness. We thank you, Father, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Well, we trust that the Word of God has made an impact in your life. Uh, thank you for watching the live stream. But before we go, I want to ask you if you know where you're going to go if you die. Are you going to go to heaven or are you going to go to hell? The Bible tells us there are only two places. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. And at that judgment, it is going to be determined if you go into heaven or if you go into hell. Now there are some people who believe that their works are good enough and they've been good enough people to just go to heaven automatically. Well, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9 that it is not by our own works. This is, he tells us very clearly in the scripture that it's not our works, but by God's grace. Uh, every single person is a sinner. Whether you think you've sinned a lot or you've sinned very little, you're still a sinner. And the Bible tells us uh, in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. See, all of us are sinners, and in that sin, he tells us here, is death comes into play. You see, because of our sin, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. That is the natural payment for sin. And that death is a separation from God. The Bible goes on to say also... That God loves us. So even though we are sinners and even though in our sin, the payment or the wage, the natural payment for that sin is death and separation from God. The Lord Jesus Christ loved us and he came to this earth. He took upon him the form of a man, being God, took upon him the form of a man. So that way he could be our substitutionary sacrifice. The Bible tells us in Romans 5 and verse number 8. But God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, we can never be good enough. We can never get to a place to where we could earn God's favor. And so while we were in our sins, while we are still in our sins, he died for us, took our place so that we could have his righteousness. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 15, it says, But not as the offense, so is also, and then he uses the term free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, because of Adam, all are dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, many or hath abounded unto many. So what he's saying here is that the gift of God, this eternal life that God gives through Jesus Christ is now made manifest unto all people, you and I together. Uh, the Bible tells us how we can receive that gift. It isn't by works of righteousness, which we have done. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
The Bible is very clear that it's not in us, but in Christ. And so how do we receive that? Well, if we were to go to uh, Romans uh, chapter 10, we would see God's plan. He says in verse number 9, But if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, there's an ex- a, a understanding of who he is. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the, the dead, the Bible promises this, thou shalt be saved. See, it's not about the works you do, it's the changing, it's the repentance. Changing from what you thought, what your mind was stayed on before, and turning unto God, rejecting those things that were were behind, and and going forward for the things that are set before you, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're here watching this live stream, and you haven't trusted Jesus as your Savior, today could be the day that you do that. You have to understand you're a sinner. Most of us don't have to convince ourselves of that. We know it at least down in our heart. Two, we have to understand that there's a penalty for our sin. We're going to be separated from God. Three, we we understand that Jesus, being God, loved us, and he came to this earth and took our place on the cross. And four, we have to come to a place to where we reject ourselves and we receive him. We reject our wisdom and trust his wisdom. And then lastly, we have to just call on the Lord. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is God's promise. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, with the heart, we make a confession unto God, just calling out to him. Now, the belief is here. It's not our works. It's not our prayer. It is a belief and a trust by faith of who Jesus is. And so today, if you'd like to do that, you can just simply bow your head, pray, asking God to come into your life, and save you. Understand you're a sinner. Understand there's separation. Understand Jesus died for you. Understand that you can't get there your way, but you have to get there his. Call on him. Some people would say a prayer that would be similar to this. Father, I come before your throne. I know that I am a sinner. I know that in and of myself, I cannot get to heaven but I know Jesus died to pay for my sin. I call upon you now to come into my life and to save me. I know it is not this prayer. I know that it is not my works. It is the grace of God. I ask you to come into my life and to save me from my sin. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you are still confused and you're not quite understanding, I want to encourage you, don't don't give up or just say, hey, I said a prayer, I'm good. Uh, Don't do that. Contact us. You can contact me at pastor at odentonbaptist.org. You can get on our website and look for uh, other areas of preaching that may be a help to you. Uh, But please follow up. Don't leave this earth. There's a lot of fear right now. Don't leave this earth without getting your eternal destination taken care of. But if you said that prayer and you have confidence that you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to be the first to rejoice with you as a brother, sister in Christ. May God bless you. Please contact us and let us know what you did that you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Thank you, and we'll be praying for you at Odenton Baptist Church.